teaching on how the church is to operate. Uh, these two books have a, a very important message to the church today. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and 15, he says these words, I am writing to you these instructions so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in the house of God. And so the books of 1 and 2 Timothy in the books of Titus, here, here is the theme of the church. Paul, or here's the theme of Paul's writing. I'm writing to you, Timothy, as the pastor, so you will know how church is supposed to run. You'll know how we're to do church. Some people think, well, you could just come here and just do whatever you want. Yeah, you can do that. The problem is we have been given instructions by God on some things on how a church is supposed to run. Now, God does give some leeway. We do have, as a local church, there's some things we can and cannot do as God leads us. But there are some instructions on how we are to conduct and how we are to do the church's business. We're in this book, in the two books, First and Second Timothy, we receive instructions on public worship, worshiping God. We receive instructions on qualifications of church leaders. We learn about a pastor's personal life and also his public ministry. You learn about how a church, sometimes we have to confront sin. We're going to learn about the important role of women in the church. We're going to study about taking care of widows and how to handle money and the importance of preaching and teaching. All of those things that I just listed and many more are included in the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and the book of Titus. So they are very important to a church. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, that's great, Joe, if, I don't know, I was a pastor, that would help me out a lot. But since I'm not a pastor, who really cares about First and Second Timothy and Titus? I don't really care about the pastor epistles. So why is this uh, book important for me to study? Why don't you just take it, study it in your office, and you figure it all out? That's a fair question. So here's the answer. Two answers. Number one, the Bible teaches us that all Scripture is important. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That means from the book of Je from the first verse in Genesis to the last uh, verse in Revelation, all of it is important. And as I taught this morning, as Christians, we are obligated, we are commanded to study all of scripture, the whole counsel of God's word. Plus, if only one guy knows how the church is run, that guy can do whatever he wants. So the congregation needs to know how these things transpire. What's your responsibility as members? What's the responsibility of pastors? What's our responsibility as a church? Church members that don't know anything about First and Second Timothy or Titus, they basically hand it over saying, hope, hope the guy in charge is doing a good job because we don't know anything on how the church is supposed to be run. So these three books are very important. Of course, we're just going to be studying 1 Timothy. Eventually, we'll get to 2 Timothy and Titus. The second reason this book is important is it's going to give you a little bit of insight into what it's like to be a pastor. You're going to gain a better understanding of the responsibilities, the pressures, the challenges that go with this calling. You're going to be able to see church from a pastor's point of view. See, most people only see church from their point of view. <laughs> You see church from your ministries that you like, the things that you're involved with, the music that you like to sing. If you have young kids, the children's ministries mean a lot to you. If you're a senior saint, the senior saint's ministries mean a lot to you. So what means a lot to, to people is what they're involved with, what they like, what they grew up with, where they're from. And so you see a, a part of a ministry. And it's a pastor's responsibility not just to see a part of a ministry, but to see a whole of a ministry. What's the best thing for Baptist Temple as a whole? And so understanding how that works, and, and from a pastor's point of view, uh, it, it'll give you just a little bit insight that it's, some people just think, well, it's my little world and no one else's. No, we're a body of Christ. And because we're a body, we have different parts and different ministries, and they all serve a purpose, and they're all equally important. And so this book, not only is it scripture, it'll give you insight into the ministries. And so Paul is writing this letter, not only to Timothy, of course, to instruct him, but to all pastors and all church members. And if you are part of this church, you should know how God's house ought to run. It's important to God, and it should be important to us. So we're going to learn a few things about uh, first uh, Timothy, or we're going to learn about Timothy and Paul and, and church here. So notice, uh, first of all, the connection between Paul and Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, we read this. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope. To Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Do you know, as a parent, we always want our children to do well. If your children are involved in sports, you want your child to hit the game-winning shot. Or you want your child to, to perform well and, and do excellent. So that's why when you go to sporting events, you hear parents screaming like mad people uh, when their kids do awesome or yelling at the refs when their kids don't because you want your child to do well. If your child is involved in uh, school, academics is very important. When they get that report card, you want your child to have all A's and you want them to do well in school. When they get a job, you want them to get a good job that pays well. And, and so we always want what's best for our children. We want them to succeed. The same way is true in the spiritual realm. In the book of 3 John, chapter 1 and verse 4, we read this. John says, I have no greater joy. Think about that statement for a second. I have no greater joy to hear that my children walk in truth. John says, there's nothing that makes me happier to hear that the people I have led to the Lord are still following God and are still in God's word. There are people that I've had the privilege of leading to the Lord, and there's been some people who, who have served under my ministry, who have come to know Christ as, my, as their Savior. And it brings me great joy when I get a letter or a Facebook message or a text message them from them saying, Pastor Joe, we haven't talked to you in a long time, but I want you to know we're still, we're still serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm still actively involved in a church. Some of the people who served under me or worked with me or under my ministry, some of them are missionaries, like Kelly Hastings in Peru. Some of them are serving in full-time ministries as pastors. Some of them are, are Christian school teachers. and Some of them are just working really hard in a local church. Coincidentally, I got a text from someone today, just words of encouragement, letting, uh, letting me know that they are still serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And when I get those messages and I see that they're missionaries and serving Jesus, there, there's a joy that comes up inside me to see some of the people who I had an influence on going and serving the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not their physical parent, I get that, but the ones that I led to the Lord, it's kind of like, you're their spiritual parent. So there's no greater joy to hear that their children walk in truth. But just as there's no greater joy to hear them walking in truth, there is also no greater sadness than people who have been saved under my ministry and to hear them no longer serving the Lord, no longer caring about his word or his work. I still believe they're saved. I, I, I remember when they got saved and they, they're not denying Christ. They just don't serve him and don't care anymore. It's not uncommon. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we, we read these words. If we have that verse up there, 2 Timothy 4. Paul writes and he says, Demas has forsaken me having loved this present world. Demas, we can go back and look. He was a fellow laborer. He was a saved person. He, he, was a, he worked on missions trips. He started churches. But later on, you know what he decided? I just don't want that anymore. And so there is a great sadness in a pastor's heart when all of a sudden those who you led to the Lord and those who you minister to don't seem to care anymore. And the things of this world just kind of suck them away. And so Paul here, the reason I talk about no greater joy to hear your children in that relationship, because Paul refers to Timothy here in these two verses as the, a son in the faith. He probably led Timothy to the Lord on his first missionary journey. We know on his second missionary journey, he took Timothy with him, Timothy with him and, they, and they started all of these churches. And what has happened over time, as Paul writes this letter, Timothy and Paul are no longer, are no longer together, and they've had a great relationship, they've had a great friendship, and that, but they've also had more than that. There is a relationship as spiritually as Paul as the dad and as Timothy as the son. We read about this, and Paul was the, the, the uh, leader, and Paul was the teacher, Timothy was the recipient. We read in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, he says, These things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Paul tells Timothy, listen, I taught you. I poured my life into you. I taught you the things of God, and what I want you to do is I want you to find faithful people, and I want you to convey that over to them. You know what I have found in my ministry, and I do not mean this in a harsh way, that if I'm going to dedicate my time to people, and I'm going to take time to be with people, and to counsel people, and to work with people, and disciple people, I decided long ago, I'm going to do with faithful people. You know, you can spend all your time in ministry trying to get people who aren't faithful to become faithful. I'm not talking about witnessing and salvation here, I'm talking about discipleship. You can say, I'm going to keep going here. This person's not faithful. Let me bring them in. This person's not faithful. You know what Paul says? Find faithful people already. 
and start pouring your heart and your life into them because then they will be faithful in reaching other people. So Timothy was this disciple. Timothy and Paul were close. When Paul wanted to know how a church was doing, you know who he sent? Timothy. Philippians chapter 2, verse 19. To the church of Philippi, he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I may be encouraged to, to know your state. When the church was struggling and needing good leadership, you know who Paul sent? Timothy. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faith, faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere at every church. And so understand this relationship, this connection. Paul is the leader. He is the one kind of in charge. Timothy has been his disciple. And now they are separated. And Timothy has been used by Paul to, to help out other churches, to check out other churches. This is a very young guy, probably in his early 20s. But we see he has matured and he has grown. And God is now using Timothy to teach and encourage and to set direction in churches. And so Paul and Timothy have a great relationship, that of a father and a son. But he is now writing to Timothy, and we see the command in chapter 1, verses 3 and 5. He says, As I urged you, when I went to Macedonia, because they're no longer together, remain where and where? Ephesus. That's the city in which he's pastors. Remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine, nor give heed to fables or endless genealogies, which cause disputes rather than godly edification, which is of faith. Verse 5. Now the purpose of this command is love from a pure heart and from a good conscience and from a sincere faith. What has happened is this. Timothy is serving at the church in Ephesus, and false teachers now have entered the church. False teachers have always been a problem. False teachers are the most dangerous people in a church. They were a problem in the Old Testament, they are a problem in the New Testament, and they are still a problem in churches today. Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So Jesus said, you as a church, be on guard. Be careful that when people are up there teaching, that they're teaching the correct doctrine, that they're teaching through the scriptures. That's why it is so important that you know your Bibles. That's why it's so important that when you come here, you have the scriptures to open to make sure that the things that are being taught here are, are accurate. And so the false teachers now have entered the church. They look good, they sound good, but in the end, they are nothing more than wolves in sheep's clothing. And what we find here is this. Timothy's a young guy. He's in a church. There's older men who are false prophets. And did you catch what Paul said? I urge you to stay. If he has to urge him to stay, what does that mean Timothy wants to do? He wants to leave. Timothy wants out of the church at Ephesus. Some correspondence may have taken place, but Paul knows Timothy's heart. Timothy is thinking, you know what? This church is a mess. I got these people over here. We're going to read about fighting and bickering and arguing later. I got these people over here who are false teachers. I got these people here who are over arguing. I got all this stress on me. I have all this frustration. You know what? I want to get out of here. I'm leaving. Ephesus can find another pastor. And Paul writes and he goes, I urge you to stay in Ephesus. The word urge isn't just like, hey, Timothy, why don't you stay? The word urge literally means to beg, to plead. Paul's saying, Timothy, do not leave that church. Stay. Be their pastor. Be their shepherd. Work through these hard times. Just don't leave. It can be hard sometimes, especially as a young man with these false teachers in the church, and Timothy is now given a command not just to stay, but to confront them and to tell these false teachers that they are no longer to be doing this. And I think what has happened is this. Timothy, I don't know him. I can't, I can't say I know the guy, but I think Timothy is kind of a non-confrontational person. I think he's someone who, when, when trouble comes and difficulties arise, that, that he internalizes a lot of things. We're going to see that as we study through this book. And so the Apostle Paul is having to kind of push him out and going, you've got to deal with it, you've got to deal with it, you've got to deal with it. And what has happened is Timothy is like, I don't want to deal with it. 
Later on, I think this has contributed to some of Timothy's health issues. Even, the, even though he was a, a young man, the stress of the church started to affect him physically. We read in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 23, but no longer or drink only wine, uh, but use a little, no longer drink only water, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake and for your frequent infirmities. Wine was used for medical purposes back there, and, and Paul goes to Timothy, he goes, listen, you're going to have to get some medicine here, because what has happened is the stress of the ministry is causing Timothy, I believe, to become sick, to have some infirmities. Do you realize that, that ministry can be a stressful place? Sometimes it's hard to realize that. I've had the privilege of this. I haven't always been a pastor, not growing up in a, you know, a home like that. So I sat in a pew or in a seat for many years. And I always thought, they got the best job in the world, man. Now, I, we do have the best job in the world. We get to tell people about Jesus and, and, and serve in ministry. And that, that is great. In no way am I saying, oh, feel bad for us or whatsoever. But make no mistake, along with ministry also comes a lot of stress. It's true in this day, and it's true with Paul, and it's even true today. If you had to guess, if you just had to guess, it's up to you, just guess. What do you think are some stresses that pastors may have that, you know, may not be aware of most people? What do you think the stress is? Anyone have a guess? Dealing with what? Dealing with people. We all, yeah, there's that, you've probably heard it. The ministry would be great if it wasn't for the people, right? I mean, that, that, that's how that goes. But dealing with people, and the hard thing is not that people are mean, but people have different preferences. People have different likes. People have different views on what a pastor should do. Pastor should be in his office 24-7 studying. When I call, I need him there. Pastor should never be in his office. He should be out visiting doing this. Pastor should visit everyone who's sick. Pastor should have the deacons do it. Pastor should, you, you listen, we get all the things, uh, people, even lovely people who I love in the Lord. Hey, I think you should do this, and I think you should do that. Oh, thank you. No, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> No, no, I'll tell you how to do your job, man. No. So sometimes there's stress with, with people. There's stress when people are hurting because you care about them and you see their suffering and what they're going through. You don't just click that off. If you work with people in your job, it's the same thing with you. You don't click that off when you go home. That, that's, that, that's with you all the time. There can be financial stresses in the church and ministries and who, where you're going to do it. We're going to talk about those things later, about what we spend it on and why and and so it can be sometimes just a stressful thing, and it can affect your health. There was one time I was so, I was so stressed about an issue here that I, I literally broke out in hives, and it's just my body had a reaction to the stress I was going through. And, and there's been times where I haven't been able to sleep at night just because of ministry and people and lives and things going on. So it can be a very stressful time, too, and I think that is what's happened to Timothy. Timothy's looking around going, this stinks, man. <laughs> I want to leave. It's easy. Why fight when I can flee? Why battle when I can bail? Why stay when I can slip out? The average stay of a pastor is right around five years in a church because after a while, he's like, you know what? It just ain't worth it. Just go somewhere else. Alexander Strouch, he writes books on leadership, and he said this, and I thought it was good. He said, good leaders always distinguish themselves by their ability to skillfully confront uh, troublesome issues, and to be decisive. In fact, confronting problems is a major part of leadership responsibility. Fearful leaders who refuse to confront problems have demoralized many churches and organizations. Run away from problems always creates worse problems. And so one of the things that Paul is trying to get Timothy to do is not run away. Deal with the problem. There's false teachers in the church, Timothy, and you're not leaving. And don't just ask them to stop teaching false doctrines. You need to charge them to stop. That means, Timothy, you need to go in there. You need to, you're the pastor. Go in there and take control of this thing and get those guys stop teaching these false doctrines. What false doctrines? We do not know. But whatever they were teaching was contrary to the message of the apostles and contrary to the gospel. I've got news for you. We also live in a day with false teachers. I don't care how big their churches are. I don't care how many books they have written. It doesn't matter to me how many times they are, they are on TV. If anyone ever gets up and says that there is salvation found in any other besides Jesus Christ and him alone, that person is a false teacher. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, 
But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than which we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now we say again, if anyone preaches another gospel other than to you what we have received, let him be accursed. Do you know something about that verse? He says it how many times? Twice. When do parents say things twice? When they want to make sure, listen, that their kids heard it. And so what Paul is saying here, I'm not just going to tell you once, I'm going to tell you twice. Anyone ever gets up and says a gospel different than what we have preached to you, that person needs to be accursed. That person needs to be eternally condemned. You need to get that person out of there. So Paul is the command to Timothy is, you're not leaving. You're staying and fighting. You're not running away from problems. You're going to stay and deal with the problems. You realize that every church will have problems. Every church has ups and, ups and downs. And I am grateful for this congregation that you guys, I have found Baptist Temple to be a very sweet congregation, a very loving congregation, a very caring congregation. But even with all of those things, eventually there's little bumps in the road because we're, all, we're, we're an imperfect people worshiping a perfect God. We are a bunch of sinners who have gathered together to serve a holy and righteous God. And with being sinners, eventually there's going to be some bumps along the road. But we don't bail because there's bumps. We don't go because there's trouble or difficulty. We stay. We work through it. We don't always get our way. It doesn't, can't always be the way someone wants or this person wants. But we stay together and we work through challenges or any difficulties because we are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ. And the mission to reach people who are dying without the Lord is so important that we cannot waste time bickering over stupid things that do not matter for eternity. Isn't it funny how some things seem so important at the moment, and then you look back a little bit later and you go, well, that was just stupid. (laughs) And that's kind of what Paul says here. He says, I, don't want, I want you to stay away, he says in, in, in verse 4. I want you to stay away from fables. I want you to stay away from endless genealogies. I, I want you to stay away from things that dispute and fight, that take away from godliness. He's saying here in, in verse 4, do not argue, Timothy, about stupid things. Sometimes people just like to fight. And sometimes people like to bring up things that do not matter forever. There was a guy at our last church, and, and this is a true conversation. He says to me, Pastor Joe, I want to come in and talk to you. I said, okay, and I thought, wow, this is going to be, this is going to be important. You know, he's coming and talk, so he comes and sit down. We sit, he goes, listen, I need to discuss something with you. He goes, I need you to know something, that I believe in UFOs. <laughs> and I told him, and he goes, I want to talk to you about it. And I said, no, 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 <laughs> we are not talking, I am not talking about UFOs. One, I have been to Roswell. It's an Air Force base. I have been to Roswell Air Force Base. I have been to the UFO Museum. The people at the UFO Museum don't even believe in UFOs, okay? So I've been there. He says, no, I want to believe in you. I want to talk about this. And I'm telling you, they're there. And I said, no, man, I'm good. I said, people are dying and they're going to hell. I ain't worried about little green men. That's what I told him. He said, well, what you going to do when they land? I said, oh, yeah, when they land, I'm going to tell them about Jesus too. But until they land, there's a lot of other people I need to be telling about Jesus. So I ain't worried about it. No matter who comes, I'm telling them about Jesus. Well, him and I didn't get along too well, but he wanted to talk about this and fight about that. Hey, hey, listen, and this is a true story. And some things in churches can come out, not, not, maybe not as stupid as that, <laughs> but there are some things, listen, if it doesn't matter for eternity, you know what the odds are? It really doesn't matter. And if it's not something you're going to worry about 10 years from now, then it's probably not something you need to worry about right now. And so what Paul is saying to Timothy is, listen, you've got to stay, you've got to work it out. And don't get caught up in stupid stuff. Don't get caught up in stupid arguments and stupid fights. If Paul Paul and Timothy were alive today, what he would tell him, he'd say, like, stay off Facebook sometimes. That's what he'd tell him. (laughs) Don't get wrapped up in all that stuff. As a church, we keep our eye on the ball. All this other stuff can go on, and our goal is to tell people about Christ. Not be distracted with things that that do not matter. And he tells Paul in verse 5, now the reason I need you to correct these false teachers, and the reason I need you not to get caught up in all this stupid stuff, he goes, the purpose for this commandment, check it out, is what? Now the purpose of the commandment is love. Do you know why you correct people when they teach wrong things? 
Do you know why you tell people I'm not talking about that? that, that, that that's getting us side-attracted. Side do you know why you don't get wrapped up in those things and you correct those things? you know why you're staying in that church and fixing the problem, Timothy? Because you love the people. And when someone gets up and says something that's not true, get up there and correct them because you love them. Sometimes people ask me, and it's a fair question, they say, Joe, why doesn't Baptist Temple work with this church over here? Or why doesn't Baptist Temple work with that church over there? Now, there are some churches we do work with. There are some churches that we help with when they go on trips and help feed people. Uh, there are some churches that they have something, you know, ministries we get behind, like the Hope Center. And so there are some things that we support and that, that we get with. But some people will ask me, well, why don't you do something with this church over here? Why don't you do something with that church? We got all these churches, all these places. Let me ask you a question. What does that church believe about Jesus? And if that church does not believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven, I ain't here to work with them. I'm here to correct them. I'm not here to stand side by side and make you think I believe like that person does if that person does not believe Jesus Christ is the only way to heaven. I'm not trying to be cruel. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm not an isolationist, but I'm just trying to be scriptural here. And if you see me hanging around doing these ministries, and, and, I'm, and I'm trying to tell people Jesus is the only way to heaven, and they're saying, no, you've got to do this and you've got to do this, there's a problem there. And I don't want anyone to ever be confused on where Baptist Temple stands when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so we strive to be involved in ministries and to do things with churches of like faith. Now, they don't have to believe every little thing that we believe. Listen, I get that. But if they don't believe Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to heaven, I'm not so much with them. I'm here to correct them. You know why? Because I love them. And I want them to know Christ as their Savior and spend eternity in a place called heaven. It is not love because you don't correct someone. So the way, same thing with your kids. The Bible says, you know why you know why I correct your kids? Because you love them and care about them. It is not love to stand side by side by other churches who preach false doctrine and keep your mouth shut. That's not love, that's cowardly. And so we, in a loving way, stand up for what we believe and what we hold. And so there are some times, there are some churches that I can't minister at the same level with because we believe different things. And I care about them and I love them but I'm not going to go ahead and send any confusing message to anyone. Baptist Temple, one of the things, one of our landmarks, is salvation in Jesus Christ alone. And churches who hold that, we work with them and we help. And churches who don't, we say, we're sorry, listen, this is the message that we need to deliver. And so Paul is writing to him and he says, listen, I I'm concerned, Timothy. I'm concerned that these false teachers ha have come into the church and, and I want you to love them, I want you to commit, uh, be with them, care for them. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 6 and 7, we have his concern to Timothy. What is, Tim, what is he really worried about here? He says in verse 6, From which some have strayed, having turned aside to idle talk. And this is the problem. They desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say or the things by which they uh, affirm. These false teachers in the church, they really want to teach. It says they have a desire to teach. The problem is here. It doesn't say they have a desire to learn. It doesn't say they have a desire to grow. It doesn't say they have a desire to serve people in the church. The only thing this group of people want to do is what? Teach. Why don't they want to serve? Why don't they want to grow? Why, don't they want... Why is it just teach? Because you get to stand up in front of everyone. Everyone goes, oh, look at that person. They're, they're, they're a teacher. Hey, the Bible says, do not let many of you become teachers, brethren, for you endure a stricter punishment. And so the, the NIV words it like this in 1 Timothy 1, 6 and 7. The NIV says, Some have departed from these and have turned to meaningless talk. They want to be teachers of the law, but they do not know what they're talking about. Sometimes it's amazing to me. Have you ever noticed this? That the people who don't know what they're talking about always do all the talking. It's like, have you ever run into someone who is an expert on everything? but really, they don't know anything. We call them, you know what we call them? Well, keep, hey, be, be good here. <laughs> know-it-alls, thank you, thank you. I, I, I was worried there for a minute. <laughs> we call them know-it-alls. 
Because no matter what the subject, no matter what the thing, no matter what you're talking about, they always like to hear themselves talk, but they don't know what they're talking about. Here is a great piece of advice. If, you're in a con- if your people are talking and you have no idea what they're really talking about, keep your mouth shut and nod once in a while. And go, mm-hmm, ah, yes. And you know what? They're going to walk away thinking you're a genius, man. But if you start opening your mouth on things that you don't know anything about, I'll tell you what, all of a sudden they're going to know that person is a fool. I get around people and they just know everything about everything. Sports teams, they know what the best sports team is. If you talk sports, they know all about it. Oh, I know everything. You talk politics, oh, we know the best candidate, and they go on and on. Computers, I know the best computer, I know the best gigabyte. Coffee, try this stuff brewed in a small village in South America, and all these things. And, and they go on and on, and I get around them, and I'm like, oh, these people are killing me. And so I try to be honest with them. I'm like, listen, you're driving me nuts. <laughs> and if you keep it up, I'm going to have to kill you. Great. <laughs> I know the best place to hide the pose, the, 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 get rid of a body, Joe. And, and so they just know everything. And it drives me. And, and, and so that has happened in this church. They have these false teachers, and they're just kind of know-it-alls. And they know the best way to do this and the best way to do that. And what they're trying to do is make sure everyone around them knows how smart they are. And the most dangerous things about these people is you can't teach them anything because they think they know everything. Give me someone with a little humility who goes, you know what? I didn't know that. Some of the, some of the things I, I enjoy about teaching in my science school classroom on Wednesday nights, sometimes I, I learn as much from the classes. I think they learn from me sometimes. Always enjoy learning new things from, from people. So his concern was that these false teachers would just eventually take over the church. So finally, he's going to correct them in verses 8 through 11. This is what he tells Timothy. He says, Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Knowing this that the law is not made for the righteous person, but for the lawless, for the insubordinate, for the ungodly, for the sinners, for the unholy, for the profane, for the murderers, for the fatherers, for the mothers of manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. And if there's any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel uh, of, of the blessed of God, which was committed unto my trust. Paul wants to make sure Timothy knows something here. He's going to correct this false teaching. He goes, Timothy, I need you to know something. The law is good if you use it lawfully, if you use it right. This gives us an indication of what the false teachers were teaching in the church. Most likely now we know that they were teaching that if you keep the law, then that law, if you keep God's law, then that will save you. If you keep God's law and you keep the commandments and you do these things right and you follow all these rules, that will lead to salvation. And so Paul writes Timothy, goes, now, Timothy, I want you to know, the law is a good thing, but it has to be done correctly. The law is an important thing, but the law does not bring salvation. The law was never given, I hope you know this, the law was never given to save people. The law was given to show us that we needed a Savior. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, Therefore by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Have you ever been sitting there reading God's word, or or in a Sunday school room, or listening to someone preach or teach, and they open up God's word, and they're reading it, and all of a sudden a conviction falls upon you, and you're like, that God's talking to me. I'm doing things I shouldn't be doing, or I'm not doing things I should be doing, and, and God's law and God's word get, gets a hold of your heart. And that happens. But God's law was never to save us. God's law was to show us, wow, I'm a sinner, and I am in need of a Savior. Did you see who God's law was for? Did you see that long list of bad, rough things, sins? Rebellious and ungodly and unholy and liars. And he goes on, he gives this whole list, and he says, here's who the law is for. It's for sinners so that they can know they need a Savior. And at the end of verse 11, I close with this. He says, at the end of verse 11, the glorious gospel was committed to my trust. See, here's the law, here's all the rules, here's the things that show us that we need a Savior, and then the very next verse, he's talking about Jesus and the glorious gospel. And he said, that gospel has been entrusted to me. 
Do you know that that gospel was not only entrusted to Paul, according to that verse, but we learn from Scripture that we have all been entrusted with the gospel. You've been entrusted with it. God has given you the gospel, and you've been entrusted with it. He's given me the gospel, and I've been entrusted with it. You say, what do we do with it now that we have it? We're to share it. You've been entrusted to share it with the people on your street, the people in your family, the people at your work, and the people you run into in Carnersville. Now, I realize you can't, as you go through life, you can't stop at every single person, but as you make your way through this world, man, God puts people in your path and in your way to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with. And you have been entrusted with it. It's a valuable thing to share. And so Paul writes to Timothy, and he starts off this letter. He says, the connection between Timothy, you're like my son in the faith. The command to Timothy, you ain't leaving that church. You're going to tough it out there. The concern to Timothy, the false teachers have taken over and they're teaching all these things. Don't get caught up in this stupid stuff. And the correction to Timothy, Timothy, teach God's word. It's the gospel. It's not the law that saves you. Timothy was a young guy who wanted to get out of there in the worst way. But Paul is going to encourage him and strengthen him and teach him how to work through the difficulties in the church. Because ultimately, God has chosen the local church to be a means at which the gospel is spread. It's so important for us as a church to run God's house God's way. Because God knows the best way to reach a lost and dying world. And God knows the best way for Connersville to shine as a light, Connors Baptist Temple to shine as a light in this community. And as we study the book of 1 Timothy, we're going to learn a lot about your responsibilities and my responsibility as a congregation and as pastors here. And I believe as we learn more about what God says, it's going to grow us deeper and be more effective as a church. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Joe, listen, that's a lot of great stuff about the church and, you know, I learned some things. Listen, you can learn all the information that you want, but the most important thing that you can know and the most important you can, thing you can do is have a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, the gospel message isn't a complicated one. Jesus came to earth as God, born, born, of a ch- born of a virgin, born as a child, lived a perfect sinless life. They, they took him and they nailed him to a cross and he died there for your sins and mine. They buried him in a tomb and three days later he rose again from the grave. And if you put your faith and trust in him, he will change your life here on earth and give you an eternal life in heaven. Maybe here tonight you never follow the Lord and believers' baptism. And it's just about time you follow. The Bible says they were saved and they were baptized. I don't, you, you might be here thinking, you know what, Joe, I've been saved for a long time. I've been putting it off. I'd be embarrassed to get up there. Never be embarrassed to follow God. Never be enga- embarrassed to do what God says. Or maybe God's been speaking to your heart about joining this church. You say, you know what, we've seen people joining. We see people getting involved. And I want to join here and serve here and be part of Baptist Temple. I'm going to go ahead and... We're going to sing a song, a hymn of, a song of invitation. And if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, this is your chance to come. If you want to follow the Lord and believe his baptism, come. If you want to join, time to come. Or maybe you just want to come and, and pray at the altar for the church. We're starting a course. We have, we, we're into 2019, and maybe God has placed some things on your heart to get involved in this local church. And if God has spoken to you tonight and something